Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me. My name is Mark Woods and I want to talk to you about driving cash in construction. There are seven stages to our driving cash in construction model and we could start at the beginning and end at the end. But that's not going to happen. Our ambition is to help you generate and deliver better strategies, better systems, better measurement and engaged people delivering better results. And the bit you're really interested in is the better results, right? So as soon as you, or as soon as we very briefly sketched out the seven stages, we're going to start with the better results. But just a bit of housekeeping first. Questions. You'll be on mute throughout the presentation, but you can ask questions using the chat button at the top of your browser, the second of the five buttons. Additionally, there is a function in the chat window where you can select whether your question is only seen by me or the whole group. We'll answer questions at the end. In terms of a logical process, the seven stages of optimizing how your construction work works and therefore driving cash to the bottom line are in order. Understand the strategy, essentially where the business is going and how it's going to get there. Everything obviously has to fit with your overall view of the future. Create the purpose. The purpose of your organization is about the benefits and capabilities you deliver to your clients. And we touch on this in the next webinar. Create the core activity map. A core activity map is essentially a picture of what you do, which shows the sequence of these activities that you employ to deliver value to your customers. It's a cut through the traditional picture of an organization, the family tree. Create the one page window. The core activity map is the central component of the one page window, which is usually a single A4 sheet or a screenshot of all of the activities you undertake. However, there are activities that sit outside of the core activity map that your customers will not have the slightest interest in, but you're interested in them. And you might want to make some of these slicker, faster, more efficient and more effective. That's the first of the four stages, but you're interested in how we get results. So it's the next three we're going to start with. KPIs. We need KPIs to be linked to processes so you know if what you are doing to improve, to drive cash to the bottom line, is working. We also need to know about variation and driving change in the organization. So let's take a quick peek at what any system should do for you. Because that's essentially what we're talking about, a system. A system should save you time, stress, energy and money. It should push cash to the bottom line. But how do we normally present data and how do we measure progress or success? Let's take a look at KPIs and understanding variation. Normally, somebody very expensive spends hours poring over tables of data like this. We have absolutely no chance of spotting the trend, turning numbers of no consequence, in this instance red, into so-called trends, things to discuss that have no business being discussed. There's a management thinker called Balastraki who's big into data interpretation and he says, it's if we give smart people the opportunity to find something, they generally will. Even more so if they are frightened smart people. Their livelihoods often depend on finding something. It's simple, obvious and wrong. We look at data in a different way. This is a plot of grossed margin for a construction product supplier. It's statistics. So obviously we need to use statistical terms that baffle and confuse. We don't. A word of warning, I am going to use some pretty light-hearted terms because I want this stuff to be understandable. But just because I'm using irreverent terms, please don't think that I'm any less serious about the importance of this stuff. We use two technical terms. Numbers that appear within the green lines are wibble wobble. That's technical term number one. Numbers that appear outside the green lines are monsters, technical term number two. That's all the technical terms we need. The monsters that are results we don't expect, they are statistically significant, and it is these that need investigating first. There is a whole and very robust science behind this methodology, which has been around for some time. We don't have time to go into it now, but if you were interested, I'm happy to take a call. The point is, Using our approach, we have a movie view of the data, not a restricted snapshot. 
this month, last time, month, this time last year view. We really can see trends and critically, perhaps for the first time, identify real signals from the noise of the usual snowstorm of management data. This helps us to make better decisions from better data. The BDI amongst you will have noticed two things on our chart. So let's return to the full size version. One, that there are two monsters, both in December. This is statistically significant stuff. Something special has occurred. And whatever it was needs to be investigated and eliminated before you do anything else. Now I could go into the reasons for the December blips, but I actually don't need to, and we don't have time. The point is to really improve a process to drive cash to your bottom line, you need to take different actions for different data points. The second thing, about halfway to two thirds of the way along the chart, there are a number of data points, 11 to be specific, which are shown in red. What's been missed by taking a month by month this time last year comparison is that for 11 months, the margin was below the long term average. The key is if they're monsters, you need to treat them as such and investigate them and make them go away before you do anything else. If it's wibble wobble, you need to look at the entire data set. So for instance, if this were not gross margin, but accidents, and to illustrate, I'm going to be deliberately simplistic here, you'd get all of the data for the whole period and tot up the different types of accidents, say by parts of the body injured. If there were lots of injuries to hands, you'd make wear gloves. If there were injuries to eyes, you make them wear safety glasses. Now, of course, you are already doing this. I'm just trying to make a point. If you weren't, this would reduce the accidents for hands and eyes each and every month. As a result, the average would come down, improving performance. You can also use tools like Pareto analysis, sometimes called the 80-20 rule, to add a bit more weight to your analysis. Anyway, so what, you may well ask. There's a great guy, a solid management thinker called Nassim Taleb, and he says, as if we want to be wrong with infinite precision instead of being approximately right. Essentially, we fall into the trap of thinking that if we process data to two or three decimal places and place it in a table and highlight certain parts of that table, we're analysing data. It's a bit like averaging telephone numbers. It's absolutely doable mathematically, but makes no sense whatsoever. Or put another way, the mistake that we make is to think that two numbers that are not the same are different. I'll say that again. The mistake that we make is to think that two numbers that are not the same are different. Essentially, all of the numbers within the green lines of wibble wobble are effectively the same. They come from the same process. Using the heights of leading actors as an example, reacting to the highest or lowest number, the tallest or smallest actor that you may have seen in a film for some time, is a bit like patting Clint Eastwood on the back for being tall and booting Tom Cruise up, up the backside for being small. The height of both actors are within the range of natural variation for the, processes, for the process of the production of leading actors. Believe me, I do know. I am that sad I have actually done the calculation against a hundred leading actors, as some of you may have seen from papers on the website. So how might we apply these lessons? This example shows where we worked with an on-site based construction team uh, and investigated and improved the percentage of jobs completed as promised. We can see for the first part of the year, the job closeout average is just 55%. We can then see that after taking action and making various changes to the process, the average has increased, firstly to 70%, and then after a second round of improvement to over 80%. This is a significant improvement in efficiency and a dramatic reduction in on-site muddle. It increased capacity and filtered straight through to the bottom line. And you might think that's easy enough, just move out the end date and I can get better completion stats because we'll spread the work over a longer period. But this particular work was being done for a national retail chain with, let's say, an assertive view of supplier management. If they say their store is going to open on the first of the month, you can be pretty sure it will. So moving the end date was not an option. How else might we apply this thinking? 
This type of thinking can be applied to a whole range, in fact, any time-based construction metric that you can think of. For instance, typical general management matrices, uh, metrics like sales, profit, overhead, cash in the bank, and project-based metrics like project profitability, project progress, estimated versus actual costs and accidents and statistics. The results can even be presented on a dashboard. Obviously, different managerial and operational staff will be interested in different performance indicators. And for best effect, these measures will need to connect both up and down and across the organisation. As such, with each role, it will require its own set of KPIs and associated charge, which can very easily be placed on the dashboard to give an overall view. And from which drill down functionality into one or more charts can be employed. The largest installation we have of this employs about 80 dashboards and each dashboard for different people within different roles and responsibilities. And there are about something, something like 1200 measures being taken, all from a variety of different data sources, many of which are updated in real time. Additionally, as shown here, charts automatically turn red for bad news and, good for, uh, and green for good news. So let's return to the logical sequence of processes. The first two stages are about understanding the context of what you're doing, understanding the strategy and understanding your purpose. That's the benefits and the capabilities that you, of what you do for your clients. Essentially, it's a case of begin with the end in mind. I was reading recently that J.K. Rowling started writing the Harry Potter books knowing what the last line in the last book would be. That was her starting point and her target. That's a really impressive example of starting with the end in mind. The point is, if you start with the end in mind, you can work back to see key processes and practices that you need to have in place to deliver on the vision. And secondly, how to link the right key KPIs and what you need to do and where you need to be for each period, be it year, quarter, month or week. So at this point, let's take a bit of a step back and think about the what, how and why of an organisation. Most organisations and construction is no different. Start with an input what I'd call a tickle. The customer says, can you do X or Y? And in an ideal world, it would end with a cust satisfied customer. The run the business activities are the internal activities that the company is obviously interested in. And the slicker these can be made, the better. The slicker these processes are, the less waste there is in the system. And the less waste there is, the more profitable the company is likely to be. So a construction company takes stuff, inputs, which might be labor, products, materials, skills, information, and adds value, designing the buildings, working on procurement schedules, undertaking the on-site construction works, snagging at the end of the job and vacating the completed site. So how can we represent this as a picture? Again, we start with the idea of keeping things simple, and we usually break these internal run the business activities into three core processes. Get job, do job, get money. It's always more complicated than this and might include a raft of other activities. Site visits to the customer, liaison with suppliers and subcontractors prior to putting a quote in and after. In many instances, it may be necessary to undertake detailed scoping and design works at the inquiry stage. So before the order is placed, simply to be able to cost the customer's requirements. And billing may not occur at the end of the process. Upfront deposits may be required in order to secure commitment which is then supplemented by stage payments thereafter. The key here is the get job, do job, build job concept is a starting point, a starting point for fleshing out the detail of the logic and the sequence of your own processes. Your diagram should reflect as much as is possible the way in which your work works. So let's take a peek at two construction examples. Each of these assignments to create these models started with a workshop with the senior team and the get job, do job, build job concept. It ought to be pointed out also that as the project progressed, in both cases, the diagrams produced at the start of the process look significantly different by the end of the process, as different ideas from different people and different suppliers and even different customers were brought to bear on the diagram. In the first example, we started with marketing, tendering, moved on to pre-contract and construction, which is often the bit in the diagram that the company gets paid for, the only bit, which is then followed by completion and post-contract activities. Essentially what we're doing here is we're taking a cut through the 
traditional organisational family tree, we're cutting through the hierarchy and thinking about processes that deliver value to the customer, rather than those responsible for our development. The original diagram is a bit fuzzy and will become clear in a moment, but supporting these core processes are some critical support processes. The first yellow box is the supplier and subcontractor evaluation. The long thin yellow box is managing suppliers and subcontractors. And the final yellow box relates to additional test and inspection activities. The green arrow is the ongoing monitoring of time, cost, health and safety and closeout. As an example of things changing, a decision was made to split these processes after the tendering activities in order to separate the project management activities, that is the stuff that's done on site, from the commercial stroke financial activities, reflects, which reflect the management of the cost of the activities undertaken on site. This was then put into a larger diagram, which is a bit busy, but again will be made clearer shortly. The systems diagram becomes the one page window into the entire system. It also shows another model we use, the plan, do, study, act model. This is seen down the left hand side of the diagram. So at the top purple level, there are all the planning activities, business planning, risk planning, planning for legal compliance, roles and responsibilities. At the bottom purple level, there are the core supporting activities, all of which can also be made slicker, faster, better. This is the one page window. It was originally done in PowerPoint and works well that way. This particular company, however, spent significant sums putting all of this into their own dedicated intranet. But you certainly don't have to do that. So this is the finished intranet diagram showing the core value act adding activities and the customer feedback processes used to improve processes. The internet then allowed click through functionalities to take the user from this high level systems diagram to procedures and performance measurement systems to flowcharts, forms and templates that are all used as part of the management of the business. As an example, the lower level of flowcharts can be seen in the next slide. This shows the first part of the process of reviewing an order or letter of intent. The roles for the various organisations and individuals can seen along the top in blue. The grey boxes show the activities undertaken and the blue diagrams show a decision, in this case whether or not to accept the order. And the green dots are where others are informed. As the system was electronic, clicking on the relevant box took you to a further narrative with additional information and also allowed click through to policies, forms, templates and other parts of the system. In the next slide, we're returning to the top level where we can more clearly see the other parts of the Plan, Do, Study, Act model and how they complete the picture of the key peripheral activities. We'll now look at a second example where the company has spliced their construction activities in a slightly different way. In this example, we've attempted to introduce more of a timeline to more granular activities. I think it's important to note that the terminology is different in both of these examples and it's my view that the terminology used should absolutely be your own. And this is key, as the more these diagrams look like your business and how your work works and the more it uses your terms and terminology, the less alienation and more buy-in you're likely to get. All of the activities shown here are covered in the previous example but at a lower level in the flowcharts. The timeline approach adopted here means that things like program management near the top of the diagram and project cost reporting at the bottom of the diagram stretch most of the way across the diagram. Whereas things like pre-construction and pre-commencement near the center of the diagram are over by about a quarter of the way through the project. So whilst both of the construction companies undertake similar activities for similar clients, the way in which they viewed how their work works was very different. Neither is wrong, neither is right. They're simply appropriate for the different companies. Again, at a lower level, each of these boxes related to a specific process and associated procedures, each of which was flowcharted, as we saw previously. However you define them, it is these processes that we want to make slicker, faster, better, cheaper, whichever adjective you wish to apply. In very simple terms, you invest cash at the beginning of the cycle on-site setup, materials, equipment, staff and subcontractors, and you get cash back at the end of the cycle when the customer hopefully pays. 
Additionally, as some of that cash is often delayed a year or two with retentions, cash can take a long time to come back into the business. Used properly, these systems diagrams with complementary thinking tools and techniques like lean and Pareto and proper performance measurement can help you eliminate waste from your process, improve your cash to cash cycle and drive cash to the bottom line. At this point, there are some figures from the Lean Construction Institute, which might be enlightening and give us something to aim for. <clears throat> They've categorized construction work into three different components. Value creating work, which they claim is only five to 10% of all the work undertaken. Work that's necessary to support the creation of value, which they estimate to be 30 to 35% of the work undertaken. And waste, a massive 55 to 65% of the work undertaken. To be fair, most people do take objection to the above figures, but regardless of whether or not you believe them, everybody I've ever spoken to believes you can always do something to be more effective and more efficient. In order to improve the cash to cash cycle, we need to be more effective, more efficient and better organized. So how do we do that? Let's talk a little about waste and the category of it. There are a variety of tools and techniques for thinking about waste, a key one of which is Tim Woods. Absolutely no relation to me, uh, as all processes will have a degree of waste. The Tim Woods framework helps you think and systematically eliminate waste issues, which include transportation, unnecessary movement of things, plant, equipment, machines and materials between processes or even sites, unnecessary inventory, work in progress, raw materials, extra copies of reports or tenders, things sitting about which are not having value added to them, unnecessary movement of people between processes or sites, perhaps taking the good guys off the end of a project before completion and moving them onto the next project and upsetting the original customer as you do so, unnecessary waiting for people or parts that wait for work to be completed or decisions to be made, waiting for the finance director for a decision to proceed with a purchase. Unnecessary overproduction, the production of goods or services sooner or faster and in greater quantity than the customer demands. Unnecessary overprocessing, processing beyond the standard required by the customer, often referred to as gold plating. Unnecessary defects of both process and product or service. In construction, this would be early warnings to subcontractors or snaggings perhaps. Now, depending on the process or activity being studied, some of these aspects are going to apply more than others. It's not a one size fits all approach. So how do we do this? It's my belief that these improvement processes cannot be completely subcontracted out to people like us. You need to engage and train your, your team to improve your processes and the results from which can be astonishing. Typically, for each improvement process, we'd anticipate a return on investment of between three to one to five to one. One way to think about what we do is, we have the thinking, the tools and the techniques to help transform your organization. We have the kit bag of skills, but you need to run your organization. We'll never be contracts managers, projects managers and site foremen. We need to work together with you and your people. So we transfer some of these skills to drive cash to your bottom line. Inevitably, it will take time, effort, money and focus. But as we've seen, the results can be astonishing. And so to conclude, the seven stages of driving construction to cash, uh, driving construction cash to the bottom line are understanding the aims and objectives of the targets, understanding the strategy, Creating a purpose that defines the benefits and capabilities delivered to your clients. Creating a core activity map that details the processes that delivers on your purpose. Creating a one page window. Linking KPIs to all processes and understanding the variation in each processes. Removing monsters first and driving the change by involving the whole team. This thinking and the associated tools and techniques are being used throughout the construction sector and many others to drive real and quantifiable change. The $64 million question is, will you adopt them in order to 
in an, in an attempt to drive out just a small percentage of the waste in your organisation and therefore drive more construction cash to your bottom line. Our purpose is to help you deliver better strategies, better systems, better measurements, KPIs, and engage people delivering better results. Thank you for listening. I hope it's been helpful. Before we take questions, just to let you know, you'll be all sent an email 